Hi, I'm Dr. Olga Pinkston, a board-certified rheumatologist and the host of the Mind Your Fiber podcast. This podcast is dedicated to fibromyalgia. I discuss up-to-date information about fibro, its treatment, the biology and psychology of the fibromyalgia. I cover the pain science education, the complementary and alternative methods available to you now to improve your symptoms. There are a lot of things that influence development of fibromyalgia, trigger fiber flares, and produce other symptoms like IBS or irritable bowel syndrome, depression, and anxiety, and none of them are your fault. In the Mind Your Fiber podcast, you will learn how and why fiber develops, how chronic pain changes your brain, and most importantly, that you're not alone in the struggle, that fiber is real, and how to not let fiber control your life. This podcast provides information only and does not provide any medical or psychological services or advice. Well, welcome back, my friends, to another episode of Mind Your Fiber podcast. Today, we're going to continue to discuss pain science education and continue with one of the probably most important topics on stress, stress response of your body and its connection to pain and fibromyalgia. So during the last episode, I explained about the primary appraisal of stress, a judgment by your brain of a situation or sensation such as pain in terms of a loss, threat, or challenge. The most common way the brain in patients with fibromyalgia and other chronic pain conditions appraises stress or pain is as a threat. There is an increased focus on pain, diminishing attention, worsening memory and concentration. It increases anxiety and fear and promotes avoidance. The loss is often associated more with the consequences of chronic pain, loss of function, loss of income, relationships. It focuses our thoughts on what we cannot do. These thoughts increase the feeling of grief and sadness, decreasing our motivation to try things may be useful in managing pain. The goal, though, is to learn how to see pain as more of a challenge, something you can cope with that does not overwhelm your body and mind. Recently, I spoke with a patient about her fibromyalgia pain and the stress it caused on her marriage. She was diagnosed with fibromyalgia a year ago. The chronic pain and other fibro symptoms affect her daily life. She complained about increased anxiety fear about the pain, thinking that fiber will ultimately cause you to become disabled. When she talked about her husband, she spoke of his anger. She thought he was angry at her all the time. We spoke about the chronic pain and how it was causing stress to both her and her husband. But the stressor was appraised by their brain differently. She was appraising the fiber pain as a threat, the most common way patients think of pain. It was a threat to her abilities. There was a potential of disability, the fear of not being the person she used to be. Her husband, on the other hand, likely was appraising her fibromyalgia not as a threat, but as a loss. His reaction to fibro as a stressor was anger, not fear. Thoughts of loss, the consequences that resulted from the pain, loss of time together, not doing things they used to love to do because she's in bed due to pain, loss of your happiness because she's more depressed now, anger that his wife is in pain was his major emotion due to loss, not threat. So just to review, the stress response is biological, emotional, cognitive or thinking and behavior or action response. Chronic pain is itself a stressor. Non-pain-related stressors of our lives can trigger pain flare-ups. How we judge stress, stress categories of, of threat or loss or challenge, can shape what we think, feel, do about our stress. These judgments affect our physical well-being and our pain. So today we're talking about the next step your brain does when faced with a stressor, the secondary stress appraisal. Secondary stress appraisal is the brain's thoughts after the primary or initial appraisal, meaning after the brain decides if the stressor is a threat or a loss or a challenge. 
During this process, the brain decides what copying options are available. Now, all of those appraisals are very quick and often are subconscious. There are two types of thoughts during this time, automatic thoughts and beliefs. Automatic thoughts, just like the name describes, are automatic. They arise automatically with anticipation of pain or in response to pain. You may or may not be aware of these thoughts. It is like a running documentary or images that come up on the subconscious level in response to a particular event, sensation, experience, or trigger. The second time is the beliefs. These are the beliefs about the pain or medical condition in yourself, other people, and the world that are stored in your brain as thoughts. Automatic thoughts and beliefs interact and influence each other, influencing coping and adaptation to pain and illness. They may or may not be factual. Just because you have a thought does not mean it is real, a fact, or truth. You need to understand that automatic thoughts and beliefs influence the degree of pain, severity, and your coping with pain. So let's talk more about our automatic thoughts. Our brain produces, on average, 60 million thoughts per day. Most thoughts are automatic because they happen without effort and almost reflexively to a triggering event, such as a circumstance, a sensation, another thought. Most of them are subconscious. It is an ongoing dialogue or commentary, a movie or images in your brain. We're not aware of these thoughts unless we purposely pay attention or if a particular thought grabs you emotionally. You may catch yourself thinking the same thought over and over. Out of 60 million thoughts per day, about 80% of them are negative. So if we average 60 million thoughts per day, 48 million of them are negative. And most of these negative thoughts are subconscious, automatic. It is evolutionary. The caveman brain was wired to be negative and afraid, wired to survive. And this is an average person, not a person who has chronic pain condition like fibro or other chronic pain or illness. Research shows that if a person has chronic pain and the more negative automatic thoughts she has, the greater her report of pain, dysfunction, depression, and poor adjustment to chronic pain condition. This makes sense. When automatic thoughts are negative, they lead to negative feelings and maladaptive or poor coping behaviors. Most of the thoughts are judgments about ourselves and the world around us. Let's practice some automatic thoughts. I will give you a word or sentence. You catch your first automatic thought. Tiny and hot beach with a blue ocean. I see a sidewalk. Spilled drink. Fancy umbrella drink. Dark street with broken street light. Puppies and kittens playing together in a basket. Halloween costume. Happy birthday song. Dentist. Giggling baby trying to walk. Didn't this feel like your Facebook or other social media feed? Do you ever notice your thoughts as you scroll down through the social media and news? Fleeting thoughts running together, some too brief to recall. Did you notice your mood change as you thought of a dentist, dark street, or spilled drink versus sunny beach or puppies? So your thoughts automatically create emotions. Happy thoughts create happy emotions. Painful thoughts, painful emotions. So when your brain automatically produces thoughts about pain, they have the tendency to be more negative. The more negative the thoughts, the more pain you experience. Greater distress, more medication is used, more loss of function, more disability. So the first step is to learn how to be more aware of these thoughts. Now let's talk about beliefs. Just like thoughts, we all have beliefs. Beliefs are our opinions, inner knowledge, something we hold on to, often without questioning. If you think a thought over and over, it becomes permanent thought or belief. We have acquired beliefs. 
something we came up with to help us deal with the situation. For example, to help make sense of your medical condition, you may formulate ideas about the cause of the condition, the pain, and how it should be treated. You may not have those ideas all your life, but as you learn about fibro, you started accumulating these ideas and beliefs. We acquire a particular viewpoint about appropriate or inappropriate response to pain. For example, I need to stop and rest so the knee does not get re-injured. I need to take a nap or my headache will worsen. You may believe that rest helps knee pain or a nap helps to relieve a headache. You acquired these beliefs from your experience or someone else's idea. We also hold beliefs on how much control we have over a medical condition. If we can do something about it, how we can cope with it. As you imagine, if you believe that there is nothing can be done about your medical condition or pain, your thoughts and emotions will reflect that. Compare this to a belief that you are in charge of your health and you can influence your pain level. Often the acquired beliefs have the underlying should or must or ought messaging. I should rest. I must take this medicine to feel better. I must get up. I got a cold, hot tea with honey and wool socks are in order. It's cold outside. I must wear a hat or I will catch a cold. Patients with chronic pain or fibromyalgia hold numerous beliefs about the cause, meaning, or appropriate treatment of their pain. Without a doubt, these beliefs influence the treatment the patients seek, as well as the willingness to engage in treatments that are counterintuitive to their beliefs. If you don't believe that physical therapy will help you, or you may believe that it may actually hurt you or worsen your pain, it would be hard to convince you to try it. If, on the other hand, you had a great experience with physical therapy in the past, say you saw a great benefit of physical therapy after your mother had a knee replacement, you may be more willing to try it. People around us also hold beliefs and influence others in believing. I often hear that relatives of the patient with fibromyalgia believe that fibromyalgia is not real, that the pain is all in your head. It is an example of an acquired belief that the person holds, but it also influences your thoughts, your beliefs. It may produce negative beliefs, negative self-talk, and emotions. So the acquired or new beliefs that we develop through life as we live and think. If we think something long enough, it can become a belief. If something strongly resonates with us, or we develop an understanding of something, we can start believing it rather quickly. We also have core beliefs. Our core beliefs are ideas and philosophies that we hold very strongly and very deeply. These ideas are usually developed in childhood or early in adult life. We often think of them as our inner knowledge. It can also be part of our personality. It is also our worldview. Core beliefs aren't always negative. Good experiences of life and of other people generally lead to developing healthy ideas about yourself, other people, and the world. Negative core beliefs may be stored in your brain and not activated unless an adverse life event triggers them. Since chronic pain or pain in general and the associated stressors are often viewed as negative events, they will most likely activate the previously developed negative core beliefs. Sometimes the negative core beliefs formed during childhood can be reinforced by later experiences, confirming their validity. All thoughts, beliefs acquired or core beliefs, although they feel real and factual, actually may or may not be facts. We may strongly believe something and think of it as a fact, but in reality, it is something we learned or believed for a long time, or it is an opinion. So we talked about automatic thoughts, acquired and core beliefs. Now let's talk about why these concepts are so crucial if you have chronic pain or fibromyalgia, or if you're healthy and listen to this podcast to support your loved ones. How we cope with adverse life events, medical conditions, or pain includes coping responses that are both thoughts and behaviors produced by our brain to lessen the stress or pain. The thoughts, automatic thoughts, acquired beliefs, or core beliefs we use to cope with the stressor, such as chronic pain, 
will influence the behaviors or actions we take to deal with this pain. The pain can be an anticipated or actual ongoing pain. Here's an example of coping with pain. Rest. Many people believe that rest can help with pain or prevent pain. Some patients with pain will use this coping method to deal with pain. They get pain, they rest. They may use it too much. An over-reliance on resting as a coping method can lead to deconditioning of muscles and general weakness. That person has more fear of pain. The stressor is pain, being judged as a threat, and the thoughts that lead to inactivity are more negative, coming out of fear. I'm afraid to move. I will hurt. I need rest to heal. Someone else may use rest also as a coping method to help with pain, but will be alternating rest periods with activity, also known as pacing, which is a healthy way to incorporate rest. The thoughts that lead to this coping method are different, resulting in more positive results. Another example of coping, overactivity. Just like too much rest, overactivity can be just as problematic as avoidance of activity for some people. Some people who routinely completely ignore pain push to get things done. They push to get things done just to crash after. This pushing and crashing cycle is very common in patients with fibro. It is a coping behavior in patients with pain, but is often not recognized as a coping method. I just push to get things done. Of course I'm in pain. I crash after to rest. If you would backtrack the thoughts and record them before pushing, you may find them maladaptive. I will have a more in-depth discussion of all these concepts we discussed today in later episodes. So let's summarize. Automatic thoughts are thoughts that are frequently occurring, situation-driven, thoughts that are often without our input or consciousness. They are automatic, without awareness, but influence the ultimate selection of the coping method. Acquired beliefs arise from experiences and often start with should, must, ought. We have beliefs about pain, the nature of pain, the cause of pain, and appropriate treatment. These beliefs influence distress and disability, as well as treatment. We also have acquired beliefs about our control of pain. We have many beliefs about our ability to cope with it, our ability to control pain, how effective we are in our own self-management of pain, and self-efficacy. Our brain uses automatic thoughts and beliefs to cope with pain stressors and reduce the stress effect. Based on these thoughts and beliefs, we may have a good or maladaptive coping behaviors. Negative automatic thoughts generally worsen our mood, negatively affecting our actions, increasing the pain in other symptoms. So here's the homework for you. Notice your thoughts. For example, if you drive a car or use public transport, notice your mind wander. What do you think about? Do you notice things around you? Do you daydream? Do you see your thoughts come in and out like clouds passing by? Does your mood change with these thoughts? Can you connect the thoughts to your emotions? Notice your automatic thoughts. Do you catch that about 80% of them are negative? Start noticing your beliefs, core and acquired. Do you believe in things your parents or grandparents believed in? Like wearing a hat when it's cold so you don't catch a cold. Or some other beliefs about your health, wellness, or mental health. Judgments. Stereotypes. Awareness of your thoughts takes practice. It may be uncomfortable, sometimes even painful. Start from the place of curiosity, not judgment. As you think about these topics, be kind to yourself. You are working on healing. You are minding your fibro. So next week, we'll continue discussing the stress as well as the fear and the fear and pain cycle and start applying this knowledge to your healing. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, the best thing you can do is to share with someone and leave a review and rating. This helps me support more people just like you move toward better life with fibromyalgia. All you have to do is to go to the platform you're listening on, click the share button or the icon, and just send it to a friend. I so appreciate you taking your time to do so. Make sure you sign up or subscribe to this podcast so you can get the most up-to-date information in the new episodes. Thanks for joining me today. 
and I will see you next week. And don't forget to mind your fibro. Disclaimer, this podcast provides information only and does not provide any medical or psychological services or advice. None of the content on this podcast prevents, cures, or treats any medical or mental condition.